All right, so I have 12.05, so I'll go ahead and start here. Um, as I sent in the chat, uh, appreciate if you guys can keep yourselves muted during this first part here while I'm talking. And uh, if you have questions while I'm talking or comments, you can type them into the chat window um, where they'll be viewable for everybody. And then after each section, I'll pause and read through whatever questions or comments got posted during that part. And then I'll react to them there. And then at the end, um, we can open it up and people can unmute uh, for more general discussion. I think I'm gonna learn from this uh, at least as much uh, as everyone else on the call. So like everybody, my perception of what's going on is colored by my own experience. Uh, and that's why I'm uh, part of why I'm having this, this webinar. I I'm, feel firm conviction here, but uh, I'd like to hear the perspectives of others. So at the end, if we can turn this into more of a conversation, I think that would be great. So to start with, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I really appreciate everybody you know, coming on here and uh, uh, sharing some of your, your day with each other and with me. Um, so I went to Rice here in Houston and did chemical engineering. So not much by way of data science or software development um, through, through that education. And then I went to work for Shell. Um, after a brief stint at a private brokerage company. That was more of a summer internship. And I noticed in the summer internship at the private brokerage company that people who entered meetings and tended to like have data backing whatever their recommendations were, tended to have those recommendations accepted. And you know, as a result, tended to wield more power and responsibility. So you know, organizing your data and having it kind of tell the story for you. Um, that stuck out as something that was important to do if I wanted to succeed in my career. Um, I also noticed that people who were having to do repetitive work using data, which is pretty common in, in the world of finance, you know, looking through company sheets or company you know, information published on, uh, online uh, publicly or elsewhere, and pulling what was interesting from that and then organizing it into tables and things like that. That kind of work was rote and time consuming and people who did it faster got further in their job doing it. Um, and as a result, had more to show at the end of any time period. And as a result, got better performance reviews. So both of those things kind of stuck with me and I thought, gosh, you know, maybe I, I need to get good at that. Um, when I went to work for Shell, my first real kind of full-time job that wasn't R&D um, in academia or, or internships, uh, I started off in chemical catalysis and downstream. And there was a lot of data that came in from uh, clients' refineries. And I worked a lot on that data and I saw similar patterns that, you know, when I got better at handling that data more quickly, uh, I got further ahead in my job. And when I got better at representing that data and what insights it showed me and what direction it steered my decision, uh, my decisions, then those decisions had more credibility and, and people respected them more and it kind of helped my career. So it wasn't just me. I kind of learned this from watching others who were much better at it than I was. And I didn't have the same background. So I spent a huge amount of time on my own trying to learn Visual Basic, which is uh, Excel's programming language. Um, it's actually called Visual Basic for Applications because it applies across more Microsoft tools than just Excel. But Excel is, is predominantly what it's used for and it actually plugs directly in. You can just turn on a developer tab uh, and, and do that work. So I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit, but this, you know, I spent a little bit more time on the first parts of this, but this has been true now since, you know, 20, uh, 2000, uh, 2007, um, that I've just noticed this trend and it's continued and has, I think, recently accelerated pretty dramatically. Um, so the same two points, if you can automate some rote task that otherwise takes a lot of your time during the week, you have more time to then do other stuff that's higher value added with that stuff that you've, you know, that data that you've, that you've automated the, the uh, organization of or the manipulation of. And then second, um, once you have that data organized in a way that's useful to you, if you can implement 
some kind of data science methods or data analytics methods on that data to inform your decisions, it's much harder to argue with those decisions. And as a result, people will start looking to you to help make decisions using data. You'll feel more confident yourself because you're not having to go out on a limb and you know, take a, a big risk with what the data is telling you. The data is just the data and it tells you what it tells you. Um, so it's harder to argue. Uh, so that was true then in upstream when I moved to reservoir engineering. And it was also true when I did software product management, um, all within Shell. So I went to business school kind of thinking, okay, uh, how can I help large incumbent firms get better at empowering their own people to be more effective on the job? Uh, and is that really job training or is it more setting up incentive programs to help steer people towards being more effective? And I did that kind of management consulting for a few years before starting <clears throat> a data science company um, here in Houston that faces oil and gas. So that's kind of my background. So I've, I've kind of got like the industry experience to some extent, probably less than many of you on this call. Um, but I also have the software and software development um, experience internally for the, the industry as well as, as a uh, software company that faces the industry. So my background is mostly oil and gas facing. I've had clients that are you know, radically different industries, entertainment and hospitality, um, other kinds of manufacturing, uh, EPCs, all kinds of stuff. But the, the vast majority of my own experience is in oil and gas, and that might be biasing my perspective here. Um, I don't think so because uh, in the news I read and in the, the job descriptions I see, it seems as though uh, this trend is true kind of ubiquitously, kind of generally across all industries. So we can touch more on that at the end there. Um, so maybe what I'll do now is I'll, I'll share a bit more about the oil industry as an example of what I think is true across the world. And um, as I'm talking, feel free to post questions about that, uh, that portion and the portion that I just talked about you know, my own background and, and conviction here. So, uh, I'm There we go. All right, so the, the backdrop here is, let's say that this, this blue triangle is the increase in demand for oil products around the world, not just oil like hydrocarbons and you know, fuel, but all kinds of oil products. And uh, it's been growing because developing countries are developing, you know, the, the quality of goods in developed countries is, is changing and allowing for you know, more luxury that requires more uh, raw materials and that sort of thing. The supply, however, um, over the last several years has been outpacing the demand. So there's more supply. This, this entire red um, here is the supply. I've just overlaid demand on top of it. So the supply has been outpacing the demand. So even though there's demand growth, the supply growth is bigger um, and is already you know, sheer quantity is, is larger. So what that does is it drives down prices and makes the industry more competitive. And uh, so that's why we've, we've been seeing in the last few years more consolidation in the industry, companies kind of going under layoffs, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's been true for a while. And I think that, that this, um, these couple of triangles kind of in oil and gas, it's about supply and demand of, of oil. Uh, but it's also about efficiency and what companies can get done around the world using less materials. So that contributes to driving down this blue here. Um, and you know, as compared to the, uh, to the supply. So uh, this is some information from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, last year, just showing that, and this is total the company, not total companies. Um, that you know, the, some of the big oil companies here, you know, losing some staff as a result of the trends I was talking about. Um, and then recently, as 
as most of us know, three you know, big shocks, particular to the oil and gas industry. The first one, less talked about, we had a warm winter. And so as a result, demand was less than we thought it was and thought it would be. And there's more oil stored than um, that has to be exhausted before new oil that's, that's injected into the market you know, is valued. So that increases the spread here between supply and demand, and it causes more of those kinds of challenges to the industry, leading then to challenges in employment. Um, second big shock, uh, front of mind for everybody, COVID-19. Basically, overnight, the uh, service sector disappeared, and the amount of consumption of oil uh, dropped dramatically. And uh, so that has another huge impact here. And third is um, all this international politicking about who's going to be the oil producing um, countries. So Saudi Arabia, you know, declaring that they're gonna uh, open the taps, produce more oil, uh, and uh, Russia and the US trying to see, you know, who's gonna do it. And if, if everyone does it, then it drives down the price for everyone else. So these things happen kind of all at once. And my point here is that, you know, as, as we've seen, all of this has increased. There's been more layoffs, there are fewer openings, that sort of thing. Um, but my point here is that if we had just taken these, these lines and this trajectory and expanded it out far enough into the future, we would get to the same net result. So I think what's happened in oil and gas has kind of propelled us into, you know, maybe seven to 10 years into the future. And we're having to adjust right now to something that would have been a gradual adjustment over a long period of time. And to zoom in on that a little bit further, uh, so I've shown the, the difference in these um, curves. This is like kind of right now what we, what we would be experiencing, and this is what we're experiencing instead because of these shocks. Um, when I think about, okay, so my, my point here is, all right, what does this mean for, for people? who are having to, to deal with being in this industry or being in other industries. Um, all industries are shocked right now to some extent. So all industries are experiencing something like this uh, with only a very few exception. So um, let's say that we uh, are an oil company and our break even price is here and the oil price is higher than that. So we're getting some kind of margin. That means that we're you know, profitable and we have dividends for our stockholders, that sort of thing. When the oil price drops, we're losing money every day. So there's a lot of pressure on us from our stakeholders. Um, if we're a private company, we have to make money. So we can't just hemorrhage money. So we have to do what it takes to drive down our cost of operation. If you plot oil price versus the ease of survival of any company in the industry, um, maybe it's not a straight line, but it would make sense that there's a lot more companies with a lot more diversity in the uh, efficiency uh, that can survive when the oil price is high as compared to when the oil price is low. Um, so when the oil price drops, only a few companies can kind of handle that. Uh, and that's why there's an acceleration in the uh, amount of layoffs and furloughs and consolidation and that sort of thing, right? So when I focus on these few companies and um, try to look at what they have in common. It's the you know key word that stands out here is efficiency. They're trying to do more with less. So I think there's two kinds of efficiency in any industry. This is just kind of a, a nice way to kind of categorize efficiency. The first is about scale. So if you're a really big company, you can do things more efficiently just because of economies of scale. Instead of buying one piece of equipment at the you know, market price, if you're buying 10 and you can put them all to use, and maybe you get a discount, well, hey, you know, whatever that discount is contributes to your efficiency there. So there's some efficiency that you can generate just from your scale. The second is operational. So that's mostly data-driven. How efficient you are actually operating your business depends on how you leverage your data. Um, so data-centric companies tend to excel here. And companies that don't leverage their data tend not to excel here. And when I say leverage data, I'm talking about generating data and organizing it and utilizing it. So there's some overlap. Uh, so you know, there's some companies that really have both of those things going. And if we look at the whole market here, like let's say these companies in the red are the companies that didn't have that same efficiency. 
if they're distressed and they're selling their assets, well, the companies that were doing okay, that you know aren't in as much debt or aren't in debt at all, um, are going to want to expand, right? And and kind of take up the space that's available to them, especially at a discount. And that's what's happening. So the industry is kind of consolidated somewhat. And the resulting companies are these companies that are data centric. So, you know, big kind of jump into the future in oil and gas in terms of demands on the workforce that result from that. Uh, and I think that this is the trend around the world in every industry, um, just kind of showcased more on the extreme end in the oil and gas industry. So, uh, utilizing the uh, the data involves automating workflows and processes at the individual level, the team level, and the firm level, but it also involves driving better decisions. So last thing I'll say on this section is about data science. Like what's the deal with data science? You know, like probably you've seen tons of uh, uh, hype in the, in, the, in the media, you know, whether it's entertainment, like there's more movies about AI and machine learning and data science and that sort of thing, or um, more discussion around what data science is capable of doing for companies. And so why is data science so popular right now? I think that data science had gone kind of academic for a number of years, but two things really are happening that are making it really relevant to firms everywhere now. The first is big increase in computing power. So probably um, a lot of us are familiar with the concept of Moore's Law. Moore's Law states that every two years, we double the processing speed of our uh, computing. So um, whatever the integrated circuit could do two years ago, it can now do twice as much. Uh, and computers have more than one processor. And in addition, the cost for a processor has gone down. So that means that we can do a lot more um, at a, a much cheaper price with our data than we ever could before. So algorithms that used to be very computationally expensive and require you to have access to like a supercomputer or something are now just available for anyone to, to utilize. And, you know, another interesting thing, my own view is that a lot of these algorithms are not, they're not challenging. They're not, they're not hard to learn. They're pretty intuitive. And the reason why they've been kind of stilted in academia for a long time is just because nobody else really had access to using them because of the computing power challenge. So now it's kind of democratized. And if you have a laptop, you know, even if it's a crummy one like mine, you can implement pretty rigorous data science methods um, right there on your own computer, or you can leverage cloud computing and, and do it just fine too. Second thing is increase in availability of data. So there's much more data to analyze now. Companies are kind of waking up to how valuable their data can be for them because you can analyze it and use it to inform their decisions. Uh, and so they're sharing it more with third party providers who help them do that. They're processing it more themselves. And just generally, there's a lot more data available around the world. So um, IDC, International Data Corporation, says worldwide data growth 5.3x by 2025. So from 33 to 175 zettabytes. Um, so more of the data sets are much more available. So it's not just there's more data, it's more available. This is interesting and was kind of surprising to me to learn that 49% of the data would be stored in public cloud environments. That's publicly available. So people just have access to data. Um, leads to competitions like Kaggle and people making a lot of money on the side just by implementing data science methods. Uh, in, in competitions and that sort of thing. So um, what this all points to in, in spending time here is when we think about how we appeal to this kind of company, if you agree with me that this is the company of the future, and this is kind of where things were headed already. Um, I told you about my own experience kind of seeing the writing on the wall and watching who, who grew in their roles and that sort of thing. Um, I think there's two things that companies want. First is experience in the industry. I don't think you have to become a data scientist, um, software engineer with one or the other, or both of those two things as your job title. You can do whatever you did before. Um, you can just learn to, to also have a data-centric skill set and apply that in conjunction with what you're doing. 
And I think you actually get much further ahead in that field than if you only had a data centric skill set. And when I look at job descriptions um, for positions that you know are, are vacant right now, I see that kind of marriage. So, hey, we want you to have five to seven years doing whatever it is in whatever industry, but also we're hopeful that you can apply you know, data-driven decision-making and you're very deft at analyzing data and that sort of thing. So I'll pause there and uh, read through to see what questions I got here um, during this first part. Uh, all right, audio, thanks for clarification. Here's one from Sophie. For those who joined this webinar because you got the Cal alumni invite, I mentioned that Alec worked at the Cal campus and did research with Cal science team. Yeah, I worked for um, Dr. Prosnitz, uh, who is a chemical engineer um, researcher. And I think he's still active there, ionic liquids. He's current, this is Alec again. He's currently an active participant supporter of Cal alumni Houston. Here's a detail about Alec. Okay, thanks for providing the, the bio. Um, I'm not seeing questions. I'll get more into the next part then. Uh, it's 1226, so maybe I'll keep moving here. Um, yeah, but feel free to you know type in more questions or, or feedback as we go into the chat. To access the chat, I'm gonna stop sharing just so I make sure I get it right for a second. To access the chat, if you move your mouse around inside of this Zoom app, a menu should pop up on the bottom. And then one of the features is like a little window with a little uh, corner sticking out of it. And that's the chat button. So if you press that, it'll bring you into a chat. And the default is you can send a message to everyone. So if you have anything to say, questions or comments, you can type them into that chat. And then everyone can see them and I can react. So I'll share my screen again and keep going here on to this um, next part. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean when I say automate processes. So I talked about CLSA, I talked about Shell. Um, it helped me when I was doing research too. Uh, there was, um, there were, there were definitely lots of times in research when I had to collect and analyze data. Uh, this, this example I just prepared, uh, assuming that I'm doing something in geology and oil and let's say that this is actually um, a, a very real example because it's something that I've experienced personally. I've changed the data around and just kind of made, made up numbers here. But the use case is, imagine if part of my job as a geologist is to find tables like this that are exported from some kind of production laboratory um, or maybe from some kind of academic literature on geology. And um, I take each one of these tables here and I need to stick them together. I need to stitch them into a single table. And I've got three different tables here. And so what I would do normally, manually, is I'd copy this and I'd put it into, let's say this is my manual process. I would paste, paste my table into here and then maybe I'd go through and I'd have to find the starting row of this file and I'd paste my table here. Maybe when I'm looking at this file, there's some information you know, up here at the top that kind of gets in the way and notice that where my data starts actually is different in each case, something like that. So I'd have to go in here and you know, paste this data in and then I would have to uh, clean this up and see how I can uh, eliminate anything that shouldn't be in here more than once. So probably my headers can go away. So I can delete those. And then when I look at sample numbers, I have some things to resolve here. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then I have 5, 2, 3, 11, and 12. So I have two sample number fives. Are they exactly the same? Or do, is there something that I need to sort out to make sure that they're, that they're both relevant? Looks like they're all the same, so that kind of thing. I'm just making this up as a, as a quick example, but hopefully this kind of process is something that you guys can relate to. We have to clean up data like this all the time as parts of our jobs. And there were three tables here, and it took me about, I don't know, I was talking, so I slowed it down, but maybe about one minute to
to do all three of these tables? That's not so bad, right? But what if I have like a thousand tables? Or what if I have 10,000 tables? A thousand is doable manually, but might be prone to some kind of human error and definitely a lot of soul sucking, you know, heartache. But if I have 10,000, it starts to become impractical for me to try to do this manually. And yet that's what's happening in like so many industries, whether you're, you know, a geologist, like in this case, or maybe a geoscientist uh, of another type, or whether you're like a lawyer or, you know, somebody in finance. Um, and the reality is you can just like do something like this, where you automatically get the same results and have them nice and organized and formatted in the way you want by building something yourself that doesn't take very long to do. So here's the manual result, here's the automated result. You just have to build it once and then it works from then on as long as the use case stays consistent. And identifying that opportunity is something that people need to get good at and then actually executing um, on that is something people need to get good at. And typically there aren't on the job training programs that enable people to do this sort of thing. Uh, you know, imagine going into a job interview and you know, being able to show off that you can do something like this. I think this is like what the industries are wanting right now. And I'm seeing that more and more uh, from people who are my clients when I go into um, the big oil companies or uh, companies in, in other industries. So that's, that's one example. This is what I mean when I say automate workflow. You find some kind of pattern, you build some little thing, and from now on you click a button and that part's done. And you built it so you understand its nuances. And if something changes in the use case, you know how to adapt. So you're still responsible. You haven't like given it up to the computer. You've just enabled yourself to free up a bunch of time to do more higher value added work. Um, so that's what I mean when I say automation. Um, on the data science side, I'll show you another example. I'm, I'm doing these in Excel on purpose here. Uh, so let's say that we're trying to um, we're trying to predict the performance of some wells. And this is still an oil and gas example. Uh, so we've got a bunch of locations and depths and lateral lengths of our wells and configurations. So these are just like some really simple. I, I made up this as an example here. But these are some really simple things that um, help to describe our wells. And we want to predict what their performance is going to be. And the performance could be a negative number, which is you know, we would lose money because it costs us more to, to you know, drill and complete and produce from the well than the actual return we get from it. Or it could be a positive number, and that's good. And the higher the positive number, the better the well performance. So how would we make this sort of prediction? Well, manually, we could go through a whole bunch of data. And we could look through all of that data and see, okay, here's a well that underperformed and lost us money. Where was it? What was its depth? What was its length and configuration and that sort of thing? Um, and we could go through all of that data and look for the connections and try to make a decision. Um, and maybe we would use some sort of, you know, regression or something like that to help us do it. Um, maybe we would plot the data and look for outliers and then try to simulate those outliers. But there are newer, and when I say newer, I guess what I mean is there are sophisticated data science methods that are only recently kind of popularized and available to people everywhere that we could implement as well that could really help us out. So for example, we could use something called random forest. And, um, random forest is not something that's typically deployed in Excel, but if you wanted to, you could. So you can like create a tree and it contains a bunch of information um, from across your wells. And then you can leverage all of the trees that you created. And your result could be something that um, you can execute inside of uh, Visual Basic. So we have what a tree does, and I don't want to get too much into this because I want this to be a higher level thing here, but the tree will look at common qualities that split your results into different kinds of categories. So we notice here that wells in this example have higher values on average than wells down here. So what the tree is doing is it's looking for similarities in the features of all of our other information, all of our other wells that overlap and produce results that we care about. And then when we um, go through and, and make predictions, we can find out which wells might work better and which wells might work less well. 
Um, and so it's, it appears here from this first pass that depth doesn't matter so much for location one for configuration C at a lateral length of five um, until we get up to a really deep well, in which case it has a, a net negative impact. If we can explain this logically, including the method itself that was used to build it to our management and then justify our decision from the data, we're kind of infallible, right? Like even if the data turns out to be wrong, it's hard to blame us for not knowing that the data wasn't reliable. As long as the data is reliable, data science, if you implement it, protects you from you know, the, the consequence of, of what would otherwise be a bad decision that's your fault. So you can, you can drive consensus very easily when you're making very logical deductions from data that everyone agreed on to begin with. You know what the data is, here's the data. How do you get that data to tell a story? So if you, if you know how to do that, you're, you're really empowered. And I think employers are looking for that more and more now. So um, I'm just gonna, as I'm talking here, I was thinking about maybe I could set up a, uh, uh, let me just take a look. If I go to say Chevron, I'm keeping this in oil and gas. Uh, I can use Chevron. I'm just gonna go in and look at their jobs and see whether and how much there's overlap here. So search jobs. Jobs. Careers at Chevron. I'm sure I can, eventually I'll find some actual job descriptions. Find a job. Um, all right, choose country. Apply for a job, who we hire. Okay, interesting. So who we hire? Chevron values, diversity of pay, uh, individual selection. Area. All right, so this is their like kind of core business stuff. Um, I'm not seeing data scientist on here so much. Um, but my guess is if I start clicking into each one of these, I'll start, oh, well, there's information technology. But I'll start seeing more that even if you're in chemistry or human resources, there's something to do um, with data. And that's probably stated directly. And even if it's not, that's, that's the writing on the wall. That's what's happening. And I keep seeing it everywhere. Um, Able body semen, that might be an exception. Consumer connection specialist. This is in the Philippines. Uh, so there's a software engineer. Let's look at this materials engineer and see what we find. Oh, here's an automation technology manager. Interesting. Um, so what did I say, senior materials engineer? Interpretation, inspection of data. Um, so if I poke around in these things, let's try this. Gather and resolve customer issues, utilizing multiple computer applications to gather data. This is maybe more of a help center role, but even here, there's going to be some data analysis that's necessary. So, um, all right, I'm going to pause there. Uh, keep, people, even in oil and gas, are hiring right now. Um, and this, I think, trend applies across uh, the ones that are. But I'm going to pause and, and see if there are any questions from the chat before I keep going. Okay. All right, well, let's get into this last part before I open it up here. I want to share about, uh, let's see, share my screen. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll go into the course in just a second, but um, 
the first, I was talking a lot about Excel. Uh, typically when I do training in data science um, for corporations, uh, I wind up doing it in Excel, which is really interesting because there's, there are other development there are other developer environments and languages that are kind of burgeoning and that uh, when it comes to their ability to handle data in large quantities and process them, um, we, we kind of outstrip Excel. And yet Excel is still a really big part of this. And so a lot of folks are asking me why, if I'm gonna do a summer program you know, to empower professionals on, on this kind of thing, why would I include Excel? Um, so I want to cover that quickly. Um, so there's a lot of different data science tools. And, you know, if you just ask a, a really wide uh, survey across a ton of different industries, you see R, Python, SQL. This was back five years ago. Um, and then there's, there's Excel um, in the mix. Uh, Spark, I think, was brand new um, back then. So, you know, interesting that it was already doing, doing well. So these are all, some of these are like backend environments and some of these are like scripting languages. So it's just kind of a mix of what sort of tools to do data science with. 2017 to 2019, Python kind of emerges as the leader. Uh, there's Excel, it's still there. Um, if you ask uh, a software company's network, uh, here's a software company that you know, has clients like these and they build software tools for those companies. The vast majority use Python. There's a long tail here, 7% of other organizations. So you notice that Excel has gone from that list. So I'm gonna scoot down here. This is a, um, this is a company that I run in that does unstructured data management for oil companies and independent operators and service companies. So really energy industry here. And uh, when we ask our clients, they tell us Excel, like 92% use Excel. So, but it's not just the oil industry. Um, so these, these are the people who are corresponding in our case, mostly the kind of people you'd see in an, in an oil company, the oil industry. But Microsoft Excel is like a really ubiquitous tool that is used by tons of people all over the place. And it's really popular because of data storage momentum so these are companies that, uh, here's how much data that they contribute into Excel and store in Excel every year. You notice energy and manufacturing is way up there, but these numbers are high as well. And we're talking about um, two to the 50th bytes or you know, millions of gigabytes. And these numbers are in thousands here. This is a huge amount of data that is stored in Excel every year. And if you want to make some sort of analysis that um, is really valuable to a company that's process driven, then you want to look not just at the real time data, but at the historical data to see what trends and patterns emerge. You're going to need to interact with Excel to some extent. So that's why Excel is a big part of this. It's also just a lot of user experience momentum. Um, a lot of workflows are in Excel. So it's not just the data is in Excel, it's that people have experience using Excel. So it's actually easier to learn data science inside of a tool that you already have some familiarity with. And then you can start to tackle things like Python that um, were built for that um, and built for modern processing and cloud computing and that sort of thing uh, and, are, and are really flexible. So in our surveys, average person has 23 years of experience with Excel. These are our clients. 23 years of experience at all is already kind of impressive in the industry, but Excel has been around since the beginning. So um, can Excel do data science? Uh, yeah, it, it has been doing data science and it still can, especially at the level that uh, just practitioners in, in general are going to experience. Like Excel is, is, is pretty good. I think that people need to learn Python too, just that's the future and that's where things are headed. But the intersection is really important if you can grab information that's in, in Excel, and you can realize that it's fast enough, you know, it's possible for you to just do something right there in Excel, you just do it, that's great. Most companies will want that from you. If you start off with Excel and then port things into Python, and then port things back over to Excel to hand off to the next thing, that's also fine. And that's probably where things will head more and more uh, in, inside of most major organizations. So, 
I'm going to pause again and see about questions. Wow, oh, interesting. Okay. Well, it's 12.45. I'm going to quickly look at the course here and just kind of talk through it and, and explain what I'm doing and why. Uh, you've got the whole background now. So I'm, I'll, I'll open it up after I go through this course. And I'm, I'd like to hear feedback on the course, but I'd also like to hear what you guys think just about my conviction that I expressed and, and the data that I showed to support it from my own experience and, and the slides and that sort of thing, whether it applies to your industry. So you could be thinking about that while I show the uh, actual course here. Ah, just give us a second to find it. So if I go. What inspired me to do this was um, the generosity and the uh, spirit of inclusion that a lot of software companies and all kinds of companies around the world started to provide during the COVID-19 um, you know, era. Uh, and I thought, geez, you know, I've been doing this kind of thing. Inley's been doing this kind of thing for um, companies, you know, internal technical training and setting up programs and that sort of thing. For companies, why not offer something just to the general public? And can we make it cheap enough and give people one-on-one -on -one enough one-on-one -on -one time and coaching to really make them dangerous in these two areas, the data science part and the automation part. Um, so that's, that's the impetus for this course. And um, when I thought about, I've taken some online courses related to data science. Um, I took Andrew Ung's um, Coursera courses and I took some Udemy courses. And um, There's a lot of great stuff. And it could be that the right thing for you is just to watch those videos and you know, take the tests online and then resort to the forums when you have questions as you try to learn this stuff. Um, so if you're convinced this is valuable to know, that's one way to, to learn. Um, I found it really challenging to stay motivated, especially when I ran across any sort of issue where there was like a discrepancy in what the video showed. You know, you click here and you do this and this is what you get. And I clicked there and I did that and I didn't get the desired result. And then I had to poke around in forums to try, try to get help. I think that kind of like learn by yourself, watching a video that's the ideal case is pretty tough, um, especially if you're working, you know, uh, already and have other obligations. So the goal was let's make it live. So there's some amount of lecture, but people can also like, you know, interact and interrupt me and ask me questions. And um, let's make it like, uh, really interactive between the, the participants as well. So that's the first main difference. And um, I've seen that work a lot better. It's a lot more effective in really instilling the, the knowledge in an intuitive way that sticks. The second one is if you get a certificate um, because you took a test online that's, you know, typically it's some kind of like really confined scripting environment. Um, and there's one way to kind of get a right answer inside that environment. And it's easy to find answers online and kind of paste them in and hit next and get the certificate. Um, it's hard to verify to yourself that you really learned it. And it's hard to verify, even harder to verify to others that you really learned it. Um, and the way that I see people most able to uh, showcase their skills um, in, a, in a job interview setting or once they're already on the job and they're defending their decisions or um, you know, justifying some kind of uh, proposal is in this kind of interview setting. So people are like, but why'd you make that decision? And didn't, didn't you consider this? And how did you build it anyway? If you can answer those kinds of questions based on your, your knowledge of software and your knowledge of data science, then you tend to do a lot better um, you know, getting hired and, and that sort of thing. So rather than give people just a bunch of tests, I figure let's also give people mock interviews so they can get really good at explaining um, the stuff that they're learning in, in a setting where people are trying to, to you know, really be critical uh, and still come out on top. 
So I think that's a good way to learn, and that's a, a it's a really good way to to show off that you have learned. So it's an important skill in and of itself. Then there's this concept of the independent project. So on your resume, if you can have a link that when people click it, takes them to some sort of page that has your software on it and they click it and it works. You know, you've explained what it is and why it adds value and you have some kind of project. They click it and it goes through and it executes and, and it works. Um, that's pretty impressive. It's really hard for them to then deny that you know how to do software or data science because there's all this evidence that supports that you can. And that evidence is kind of irrefutable. It's not a, uh, a certificate from an organization they haven't heard of. It's something that, that really speaks for itself. And I've seen that kind of get people ahead a lot further. Um, my experience with this typically is I help people inside of a firm build some sort of software to automate part of their, their workflow and then they showcase it in the firm and it winds up getting them another job, uh, some sort of promotion or you know, lateral switch to something they're more interested in. Um, so I've seen this work a lot and I think it, it works generally. I'm, I'm excited to sort of try it out on the general public. So these are the three big things that I'm trying to do differently. Uh, this program is gonna go from the end of this month for a month and a half. Uh, evenings and then extra help on weekends and then I'm, I'm also just because it's my first time doing this for the general public as opposed to for a pre-vetted group as part of a professional society or, or a client company um, I'm just guaranteeing the content so if anybody signs up and it goes you know one part is something they didn't fully understand and we've already moved on they can always come back and schedule time with me or someone else in the until they feel confident that they fully understand it. So it's a month and a half because I don't want to drag it out longer. I think that people can do it in a month and a half. Um, but if people have more questions or want to continue to work on something or need some additional guidance on one or more of the parts, then they can circle back whenever and I'll just be available and so will others at any. So that's kind of the content uh, delivery guarantee. I feel like if you pay for this and join this course you deserve that um, so let's see I'm starting to get a bunch of questions here I'll answer these and then I'll open it up uh, let me stop sharing all right so uh, did you do besides oil and gas similar sectors such as petrochemical companies have involved their employees or hired data scientists that's true perhaps I could get Michael my company to speak here in the future hey that sounds great Michael, this, this is a DAO. Yeah, um, I've seen a lot of that. I, you know, and I work with data scientists um, who do not come from the industry that we are targeting, who are just pure data scientists. And uh, I find that there's a really different type of work that the data scientists can do that's very value added. It's fantastic and it's, it's needed and there's a shortage of data scientists. Um, but it's a different type of data science than the kind that enables the individual contributor inside of you know, whatever their core to business role is. At Dow, maybe they're a you know, chemical engineer or a structural civil, civil engineer, something like that. Um, if they can write their own scripts to do things, if they can implement something, it's a data science method, you know, K nearest neighbors to figure something out. Uh, that's a different type of value that's just as valid. So I don't, I really like data science and I really like data scientists as a job title. And I think that most firms need data scientists, but I don't like that there's this general public perception that data science is off limits to anybody unless you're like somehow a, a data scientist, you know, by stamped, uh, you know, professional title and academic certificate. Uh, so I think everyone can do this and there's a lot of room for everyone to add value in their own role. I've been leading an internal group that is driving the practical automation discussion in our office. My background is VBA. Cool. Can you say more about the intersection between Excel, VBA, and Python? Yeah, I only briefly touched on that. Python is really kicking butt. Like, just, you know, as an example, I was talking about Spark earlier as a back-end cloud computing, like, processing tool. So if you're using something called Spark, um, you can very quickly navigate across very large bodies of data 
using, even if it's like a very sparse matrix, and you get back quality results almost instantly. Hey, that's great. Um, now there's a way to use Python uh, and usurp Spark even in that area so that you don't have to, it would take a while to explain, but you don't have to use, uh, you don't have to, to first decompose what your scripts are and turn them into one type and then run each one separately and then recombine them. Now you can just run your script across everything uh, in your back end and still get results instantly. So it, the equivalent in Visual Basic would be like you you know, hit equals and start referencing another cell, but it gives you all the options from across every Excel file you've ever written. And you can instantly reference something like that. Um, it's, it's kind of like that sort of power. Uh, that, that would be hard to do because you wouldn't know exactly in Excel which things you wanted to reference. So if you somehow did, maybe that's the analogy. Uh, so Python is doing really well. Uh, and I think Python will continue to expand um, across industries. So getting some exposure to it is great. But like I said, all the data inside the industry is in Excel. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta use Python that pulls things from Excel as a start. And if you get really good at that, you can help drive the transition, I think, within your firm. All right, so next one. Thanks for helping us understand how we can use data science techniques. Nowadays, we have a lot of data stored in cloud and APIs. How much time do you think it will take for someone like me who had basic Python skills, and that's good, and solid Excel skills, but no API experience, never did a Python project to become an expert in interacting with APIs? Um, learning about APIs is not that tough. That's something else that's getting easier. Um, it's like a little weird, I guess, at first, but um, you know, I would back up and say, you know, is that even a pre prerequisite for adding value in your company or in your industry? Um, it might be for yours, but I don't think it is generally. Um, I think a lot of people get really good at adding tons of value through automation and through um, implementing machine learning data science methods without ever dealing with anything about APIs. All the data is just inside of SQL or Excel or something inside their firm. I want to upload a project from Kaggle from Jupyter Notebook and not able to do that. Cool, yeah. So Kaggle makes it pretty easy. Um, as compared to, you know, I guess there's there were some press predecessors uh, for Kaggle. Um, I don't wanna get into that, but there definitely are tutorials. So um, let's see, I'll send my email into here. Uh, and uh, if you ask me that same question in an email, I'll find and send to you a tutorial about that. Uh, that was from the Samsung Galaxy. All right, a couple more questions. I have some commitments that may prevent me from doing the course the first time around. Will it be offered again later? I sure hope so. You know, I wanna, I, so far, the feedback I've gotten when I switched from just doing this for um, client companies to doing it for industrial professional societies, from getting people from different backgrounds and different companies and kind of mixing them together, that feedback has been positive so far, which makes me think that uh, doing it for the general public in this format will also go well. Uh, of course, you know, I'm going to incorporate a ton of feedback as I go. Um, I would say so it's likely that, that we do it again. Um, we might see the price change and we might see uh, the format change a little bit, but yeah, likely, likely done it. We'll do it again. Uh, existing AI tools seem to be a threat to human job. Is that true? Uh, kind of. Yeah, I think it is true. Um, you know, when I go to uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers planning sessions where there's tons of people who run companies, a lot of what they talk about, this is true of Darcy Partners and you know, true of like a, a lot of the organizations uh, uh, in my industry. And, and I think pretty easy to project that it's true of other industries as well. The big topic is de-manning, de-manning, getting rid of people. It's kind of scary, you know, and, and a time when there's a lot of unemployment. And so I think, well, how do you help people become and stay relevant? There's so much that humans can do that machines cannot do. If your job overlaps with something that the machines can do, but also has some part that only humans can do, then if you get good at helping the machines do the half that they can do, that's already adding a huge amount of value and firms will see that like, wow, this person 
just automated something that used to take so many man hours. That counts towards their goal of demanning. But if you can also show that, hey, because you did that, you're now better at taking whatever the results were, typically it's some kind of data thing that you automated, taking those results and applying your human intellect and making some kind of recommendation or decision much better. Yeah. Cool. Wow, I barely got through that last question. Um, if anyone still wants to chat, we're already at 1 p.m. here. Um, oh, here's another one. Uh, I'll keep taking these questions, but go ahead if you want to, if, if you're dying to say something, um, go ahead and you can unmute and start talking or, or share your camera if that's your preference. You see this course helping in restaurant or hospitality industry. Um, yeah, it depends. I, I actually did some work for, yeah, I'm allowed to say for, for Sheraton um, as part of the, what's it called, the uh, Starwood Hotels and Resorts. And it was a data-driven you know, process. Uh, so, you know, it had to do with customer delight. We were looking at reviews from across tons of customers for a particular hotel that had really high reviews. And we were trying to figure out ideas for how we could you know, go one step further and do even better for the customers. Uh, and that was a very data-driven process. Um, yeah, but even, even if you're not um, working on a high strategic level that way, you know, imagine if uh, you're a receptionist and you start to track data about people who are coming in and what they're saying and doing. And then you use that data and you derive some kind of conclusion about what could go better. Um, maybe you have some samples of, of having done that new activity and proven that it goes better with the results of the data. You can then take that to management. And how are they going to argue with you? If you say, hey, from now on, we should have two lines instead of one or we should do this, or we should do that. You know, that, that kind of initiative, I think, is open to anybody in any, any industry. Thanks for the positive feedback here. That's really encouraging. You know, hey, another thing is, like I said, this is the, the first public one. Um, I did a lot of research into what these kinds of programs cost, uh, and I tried to cut that price down, and then I cut it in half when I saw the unemployment numbers. Um, so it went from 10 uh, down to six, and now uh, down again to three. Um, if this is interesting to you, but there's some financial handicap, you know, some, some kind of need for scholarship or something like that, I'm pretty open-minded. Um, collecting the data on how effective this is for general workforce is a big motivator for me, as is how can you just be really helpful with this content. I feel so strongly about these two skill sets. It's just like, like I, I see it so much and I can't, I can't get over the discrepancy between how strongly I feel and how it's not on the radar for a lot of folks. And so I, I just kind of want to offer it up and, and share. Uh, so that's, that's really the motivator here. So just reach out if, if you're interested and in, you know, what you're seeing doesn't exactly work for you and we can talk more about it. Just wanted to say, uh, you know, it's nice to meet someone of a like mind on that, <laughs> too, because that's kind of for many years, even when I was like an intern um, in the geotechnical field where, where I'm at, currently I'm a geotechnical engineer, but, uh, and uh, that was kind of how I tried to think about things. Was <laughs> I was introduced to Excel VBA, or someone told me I should study Excel VBA uh, early on in my career, so that's kind of eased into that and <laughs> nice. and it's so nice. you were kind of self-taught then in VBA yes. is that right yep. yeah what was that like was it you know you, you have to do your work so you do it and then you stay late and you're trying to look through you know help well yes yeah, so before. it was um actually so technically I had a class on VBA all the way back in high school it kind of gave me a foundation of good coding practice and then when I started to get into Excel VBA it was like 
once you found out what, what objects you needed and what you know how to re reference ranges and cells and things then it was pretty easy to pick it up and a lot of googling of how do i do this or yeah. are you the macro <laughs> recorder yeah. to you know that's see that's the doing. part i hate I, I what i wish is that people were just limited by their own imagination and logic as opposed to yeah. by the syntax. <laughs> like, if you're like, how do I do this? Well, you already know what you want to do. And so like, you shouldn't be handicapped anymore. <laughs> you should be like able to, to move, but instead you got to search and whatever. That's why I think like little like group projects, something that's really great about Zoom as a learning platform is mm -hmm. these breakout groups. You can get people kind of coding together. And in okay. Python, you can have people coding simultaneously the same file, right? Yeah. So, you know, and, and you can distinguish okay. between notes you know, and comments versus actual code and code comments. Okay. Yeah, so that kind of thing like helps a ton. So if I'm like, oh, what if we tried this? Does anyone know how to do that? And someone's like, oh yeah, here's the syntax. Then you learn it, you remember it, and nobody spends time, you know, mm. Googling and stack overflowing those those kinds of okay. like, syntax questions. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Wow, so I got another question here. Um, let's see, most of the public sector organizations are old and hence they have their data in Excel. So Excel is an essential, yeah, I, I agree, yeah. Uh, but not just public sector, I mean, like, gosh. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe it's not a surprise, but Microsoft, you know, where do they store their data? A lot of it is stored in Excel. I mean, it's their product, so maybe, you know, it makes sense. But, it's same in, in our office. Yeah. Every engineer in the office, if you want to roll something out that everyone's going to use, then yeah. it's got to be in Excel in some way. Yeah, and, and and you know another thing that's interesting about that is often there are um, security uh, challenges that need to need to be overcome when it when it comes mm -hmm. to switching away from Excel. So mm -hmm. if if say say you know you run a firm and you set up a IT you know uh, um, kind of cost center inside of your company. And their job is to make sure that data is not breached and nobody steals anything. And right. It's very easy for them to say, whoa, like I don't want any you know, cloud processing and I don't want you to be able to install something on your, into your web browser that you know, is a plugin that pulls data from Excel, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, the pressure on those parts of the organization is pretty strong right now. And mm -hmm. I deal with that all the time uh, running Delphin. So when we go talk to a client, typically there's some kind of business incentive to use us. I mean, mm. In every case, there is hopefully. Uh, so that, but that's what drives the conversation. And then when when IT gets involved, they're like, "Wait a minute! Our mandate here is to stop this from happening, right? Like we're not supposed to let some other company come in and, and manipulate yeah, yeah. the company's data." But the company is saying, "Wait, well, that's what we want. We need them to do this. You know, they handle the unstructured data." And so then IT actually needs to get kind of reworked a little bit. That's happening more and more, but yeah, so uh -huh. that's the, that's true in, in public and private sectors. Another Even question. To, yeah, oh, to yeah go ahead. It. Did you want to react? I was going to say real quick to use it, you know, once you've made a VBA program, if someone else opens it, they still got to click to enable macros and, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and that, that can require, you know, like I, when I, I, at Shell, I guess back in 2010, I would do these like lunch and learns. And I'd be like, all right, so, you know, I, I sent out the survey, you know, 90 something percent of you said that, yes, it sucks to spend X hours a week doing this and that. And here's what X is, you know, here's how much you, time you said you spent doing that. My goal is to show you that if you just click here, enable this thing and do the, and already I had lost some people, you know, even though they were the ones who were like replying, like, you know, if you want to complain at lunch about, oh my God, we've got, you know, 38 more files to look through. They're each 60 pages long and we're supposed to have it done by Thursday. Like this is going to suck. It's like, well, or maybe it wouldn't suck, you know, like maybe we could. Yeah. So I think there's been a lot of like feet dragging um, in, inside of traditional industries about this stuff, but the, the time mm -hmm. has really come mm -hmm. to change. And I think it, yeah. it, it's it's almost impossible to, to drag your feet in that in that way anymore yeah uh, all right is there a basic understanding or experience one must already have using VBA or Python before benefiting from this course no if you've used Excel that really helps if you have high school level math that's great um, but you don't have to have already done anything in Visual Basic or Python you haven't have had to script at all so we'll get you comfortable with that like if you um, 
it's kind of some some of these projects are designed to be somewhat self-paced. So you know the benchmark that everyone needs to get to is like here, um, but the possibilities of what you can accomplish in that time if you started already beyond that benchmark are way past it. So to say that in a different way, like let's say there's you know a two-hour uh, um, session, um, I'm probably talking for about 30 minutes, and then there's a 30-minute exercise. That exercise allows you to um, start from zero and get somewhere good, or inside the same exercise, if you want to keep going, you can keep on going, and there's more and more you can do in that time. Uh, and then, you know, reinforcing fundamentals is good for people who already have experience, especially when you're distinguishing between the fundamentals as they apply to Python versus Visual Basic. And I really believe right now you kind of need to learn both if you're you know, staying inside of almost any industry. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I, I try to design it to be useful to people who have some background as well as totally accessible to people who have no background. And there's so many courses that are like, you know, an intro to Python. But then like the first lecture is like, all right, so you're just going to, you know, import, you know, this library and open up your Jupyter notebook and then we're going to get started. And you're like, what? I, well, I don't know how to import. What the heck is a Jupyter notebook? You know, this other link says to use something called Colab. Now I'm totally stuck. I want it to like be accessible from the beginning. Like this, like you have no idea about this stuff. You can start from scratch and get somewhere where you're dangerous. <laughs> you gotta drop off thanks so much for yeah the, thanks for, for joining in and, and appreciate your turning on your camera and uh cool yeah. seeing that 3d printer back there too that looks nope. <laughs> i've got another one that's working right now too. oh no way oh yeah there it is moving around yep. that's cool all right nice yeah well thanks for joining and maybe talk to you later so. yeah yeah i hope so